Hi there, my name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and this is the summer 2020 offering of ECE 3084 Signals and Systems. For a couple lectures now, we've been looking at these canonical second order filter functions. We've mostly been characterizing filters in terms of a natural frequency omega n and a damping factor, also called damping ratio, denoted as the Greek letter zeta. But for the purposes of this lecture, I'll prefer to use a parameterization in terms of a quality factor that we explored at the end of the last lecture. So we can replace zeta with 1 over 2q. And if I do that, these terms in the middle of the denominator turn into omega n over q. And then in the numerator here, our constant will now be omega n over q. So this is a more common way of thinking about things in audio and music and filter design in general. Zeta tends to be more common in control theory literature. And let me make my silly little chart bigger. Okay, that looks thoroughly ridiculous. So here's something interesting about this bandpass function. If you take any horizontal slice, and it doesn't matter where you slice it, pick anywhere you want. Let's say we pick it down here. This horizontal line is going to intersect my graph at two points. Let's call one of them omega L for a lower frequency, and the other omega U for an upper frequency. And again, it doesn't matter where you do this. You could take a slice here and find the lower frequency and the upper frequency, and what I'm about to tell you still works. If you take omega L, multiply it by omega U, then you'll get omega N squared. So omega N is equal to the square root of omega L times omega U. So it's not particularly obvious in the way I drew it here, but I was trying to indicate that if you're looking at your omega axis on a linear scale, your function here is not symmetric. It has to come down from the peak at omega n, the natural frequency, and hit zero exactly. But on the other side, it has to basically trail off slower and slower, going into infinity, but technically never quite reaching zero, although of course it reaches zero in a limiting sense. So if I were to take the logarithm of both sides of this equation, I could write that log of the natural frequency is equal to log of the lower frequency plus log of this upper frequency. And what's fascinating about that is that humans perceive frequency on a logarithmic scale. For instance, if you were to play the A above middle C on a piano, that's 440 hertz. If you want the A an octave above it, then you would need to have 880 hertz, but the A an octave below it, that's 220 hertz. So humans are going to perceive each of these octaves as being an equivalent amount of frequency, the way we perceive it. We'll perceive it as being the same change in musical pitch. But the underlying frequencies you need to change to make that happen, that's doubling each time. So what this means is that although the center frequency is not the arithmetic average of this omega L and this omega U, it is an average in logarithmic space. It's a geometric average. So that means that in this bandpass filter, you as the human are perceiving this amount of frequency space as being the same as this amount of frequency space, even though plotted on a linear scale, this upper section of the graph is bigger. It takes up more frequencies. This is one of the main motivations for creating Bode plots. In a Bode plot, you plot the horizontal axis on a logarithmic scale so that this extent and this extent show up the same on the Bode plot. But another interesting thing about Bode plots is that in a Bode plot, you plot the vertical axis on a logarithmic scale too. And that's actually how humans perceive volume. So if you have two violins and you want it to sound twice as loud as one violin, 
that's a different story than if you want something to sound three times as loud. You can't get three violins and have it sound three times as loud as one violin. That's why string sections in orchestras are so massive, because in order to get an equivalent to perceived change in volume to the listener, you have to really, really, really continuously be pumping up the amount of sound that you're putting out. So Bodhi plots aren't just motivated by the fact that we have a nice set of rules for figuring out how to sketch approximations of them using line segments. Bode plots in both the human perception of pitch and amplitude make a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense to do everything on a log scale. And I am very glad we're nearing the end of the semester because, as you can tell, my voice is really starting to go out. So let's look at one very particular cut. Here I'm plotting this on a vertical scale, so let's call this 0.707 as an approximation to 1 over square root of 2. So this is the half power point in the sense that if I were to square this, I would get 1 over 2. Let's look at the very particular lower limit. Let me write, how about omega L 1 half? And I'll write the upper limit here as omega U 1 half. Let's define the bandwidth as the distance between the upper half power point and the lower half power point, again, on this linear frequency scale. So this is the bandwidth. And it turns out that this Q is equal to the natural frequency over the bandwidth. You can look at the textbook for a proof of that. Or similarly, the bandwidth is the natural frequency over Q. So Q and bandwidth are reciprocals of each other. As you turn up Q, the bandwidth gets smaller. But notice we have this omega n sitting here. So what this means is that if you fix Q and you change omega n, the bandwidth is automatically going to change as you scale omega n up and down. And that's tremendously useful from a music application standpoint because if you imagine that you fix the bandwidth and you sweep omega n upward, what you'll find is that the listener will perceive this filter as having a smaller quote-unquote bandwidth, even though the bandwidth is technically the same. So this is the case if you fix the bandwidth, but you sweep omega n. Now, if you instead fix q, but sweep omega n, then what happens is you'll start with a bandpass filter with a certain bandwidth at a certain frequency, and then as you sweep it upward, the bandwidth is going to increase. Your filter is going to be wider in linear frequency space than it did when omega n was at a lower frequency, and the net effect is that your listener is going to be happier, or at least they'll have a sense that as they're listening to it, as you sweep this filter up and down over the frequency range, it will seem to them like the filter has the same effective bandwidth because it's compensated for that logarithmic way that humans perceive frequency as musical pitch in the underlying mathematical structure. And what's really cool about this is that this capability is built right into this formula. It's not like we built some second order filters and then said, oh no, we have the ability to change the center frequency and the bandwidth, but as we sweep it up and down, the humans would perceive the higher center frequency situations as sounding thinner and having less musical content. We have to now add all of this extra hardware or whatever to compensate for that. It's just built into the math. In the realm of music synthesis, analog music synthesizers that use two-pole filters will often use one of two topologies. One is called the state variable filter, and the other is called a solid key filter. These particular topologies are particularly popular because they readily give you separate control over omega n and over q. As an aside, this business about humans perceiving frequency on a logarithmic scale is why white noise sounds so high-pitched to us. White noise, technically speaking, has its average frequency content equally distributed throughout the frequency range. 
A mathematically rigorous discussion of random signals is beyond the scope of this class. If you're interested in learning more, you can take ECE 4260, which is an undergraduate class on random processes and their applications. Anyway, because we perceive pitch logarithmically, this little section down here, down at base frequencies, essentially takes up the same amount of mental pitch space in a human as this range of frequencies. Roughly speaking, this is a notional graph. So all of this stuff is getting compressed into a certain perceived pitch range that matches the amount of stuff you have here. So the net effect is that the human listening to white noise thinks there's a lot more high frequency stuff going on than there actually is, than you would see on a spectrum analyzer. So pink noise sounds much more balanced to ear because pink noise is deliberately constructed to have less average frequency content as you go up in frequency. You've got this much frequency content at the upper end being compressed down, and you've got this much frequency content at the lower end, and everything here kind of balances out. This is also why a string quartet will usually have one cello, one viola, but two violins. If you think of a low note being made by a cello, let's say it's 100 hertz, it will create a series of harmonics that are filling up the frequency space in a linear fashion. However, as I mentioned earlier, humans perceive pitch logarithmically. So the human is going to perceive, say, these harmonics here between the 500, 600, and 700 as being jammed into this octave, but it will see this 300 hertz alone jammed into the space in this octave. The harmonics of a cello are going to occupy a lot of space at that lower end of the frequency spectrum, whereas higher pitched instruments like the violin, those harmonics are going to be comparatively spread out. So you need several voices to sort of cover that higher frequency pitch space. This is also why if you look at a choral arrangement, you will see the sopranos and altos and possibly even the tenors when they're singing higher notes, playing notes that are relatively close together, but the basses will sort of be way down during their own thing. And if you try to take the basses and the tenors and have them sing a close interval way down in their respective ranges, you can get something that sounds kind of muddy. Not necessarily bad, but it's a strange sound that a composer will probably employ as a special effect and probably not use as one of their bread and butter compositional techniques.